one with us. Highest of all creation, he lives among the least. He journeys with the rejected and welcomes the weary. Come now, all who thirst, and drink the water of life. Come now, all who hunger, and be filled with good things. Come now, all who seek, and be warmed by the fire of love. Greetings to you in peace from God the Father who created us, from Jesus Christ his Son who redeemed us, and from the Holy Spirit who comforts us day by day. Amen. Let's sing together Amazing Grace. Let's listen to our call to confession. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes that we make, and about how well or how poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning with our prayer of confession. 
And we know, Lord, that none of us this week has walked in the way that you call us to walk. Because we recognize, Lord, that each of one of us has veered from that path in one direction or another. And we realize that, Lord, that we've done so in our work, in our leisure, in our home, and even in our relationship with you. And we ask, Lord, in all those places and all those areas that we may strive seriously to do better, even as we recognize our inability to do best. And we are so comforted by your ability to forgive us. But that does not diminish the sinfulness of where we fail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our words of assurance come from Isaiah. Come, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become white as wool. Amen. Let's do God's will for our lives as we review what calls what the life that God calls us to. You shall have no other gods before me. From him and through him to all him are all things. To him be the glory forever. You shall not make for yourselves an idol. In Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Let us continually offer to God sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Word on you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. You shall not murder. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You shall not commit adultery. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You shall not steal. Those who have been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their hands, so that they may have something to share with those in need. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Second, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. How great is our God. Let's join in singing that together.
At this time, we have a children's message. Now, I understand the children are not going off to Sunday school um, afterwards, but I would like them to come forward so that I can tell them a little bit of a story as we also tell it to everybody else. Why don't you just sit right there, that's it. And that gives me a chance to sit too. Can you guys just sit right over there, that's it. Yeah, but I'm gonna do it different. <laughs> okay. So what do I have here? It's a what? A statue. It, there is a girl who's got the sermon already. Yeah. <laughs> There's the eyes and the nose, that's right. See? Don't I look ugly? <laughs> yeah. This is actually a carving that I brought back when I came back from working in Africa 35 years ago. Because I worked in Nigeria for six years as a doctor at a hospital. Yeah, there's another statue. I'm going to tell you a little bit more. I did not carve this. I can't carve this good. But the interesting thing about this is that it's not all that different from the kind of carvings that people did worship at one time. In fact, there is even a religious symbol on this carving. And I wonder if any of you guys, or you guys, know what it is. Brilliant. He's got it. The Omega symbol. It's right there. Now, why is this on here? And it's not because these people knew about the Omega symbol. When iron was first traded in Africa by Europeans, I mean, yes, Africans knew how to cast iron to a very small extent a thousand years ago and more, but in terms of large amounts of iron, it first came from European traders. And they shaped their bars of iron like this. It's, this is not quite that old, but this is how they shaped them. So in the 19th century, when people were working with iron in most of Africa, they got it shaped like this, and then they made their own little forges and changed it into the things they wanted it to be. Why did the Europeans make it in this symbol? I have no idea. But it clearly was a symbol of wealth, and that's why I think it was here on this mask. Maybe because it looks like a head. Well, it, the whole thing looks like a head, and then there's all kinds of interesting carvings here. See all that? Those are all facial carvings. And when I worked in Africa, most Africans had carvings like this. That they decorated themselves the way people still decorate themselves with makeup and tattoos. But anyway, that's that. So as I said, it's not that different from the idols that people had. Now, this fellow is a different fellow, and he dates from a different age. Do we have any idea who this guy might be? Older. Yes, definitely older. In fact, he was even in the Bible. Yeah, he's one of the characters that plays a role in the Bible. Hmm? You want to see the shirt thing? Uh, well, you know... It's a good idea. The shirt thing is how I learned out who it was. 
because when I bought it, I didn't know. And the guy who sold it to me didn't know. And that's one reason I got a very good bargain out of him. Yeah. But then I started looking through all my old Roman photographs and things, and bingo, there it was, Caesar Augustus. And he's a pretty unique guy because he was the emperor of Rome for 41 years. And he died in his own bed. Both of those are unique accomplishments for a Roman emperor. But the other distinguishing thing is Romans worshipped him as God. They truly did. They created big temples to this guy. Uh, it seems a bit peculiar when you think that in later Roman history, they assassinated more than half of their emperors. What, so that they didn't believe in the God that we believe in. And that's what the sermon is all about. Okay? Before you, goes back, you guys go back to your seats, I just want to have a word of prayer. Okay? And then we'll go back to your seats. And this shall also be the word before we open the Bible. Father God, we come to you this morning to thank you for these young children and their inquiring minds. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to teach them and to teach all of us more about your word. And we ask, Lord, that you bless the opening of that word as we explore it together. Amen. Okay. Uh, scripture reading this morning. <laughs> We're all, yeah, yeah. You guys can go back and sit down, okay? Yeah, I don't know the story. Scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah 10, verses 1 to 12, and also from Matthew 16, verses 13 to 19. So Jeremiah 10 is found on page 1191. And Matthew 16 is found on page 1527. So from Jeremiah 10. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations, or be terrified by signs in the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. For the practices of the peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails, so it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in the cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. No one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you, king of the nations? This is, this is your due. Among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. They are senseless and foolish. They were taught by worthless wooden idols. Hammered silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. What the craftsmen and goldsmen have made is then dressed in blue and purple and made by skilled workers. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal God. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. And then to Matthew 16, verses 13 to 19. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, What do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I will tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, you will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven.
Before immigrating to Canada in 1955, my father was a market gardener. From a single acre of land, his spade, his scuffle, his hand cultivator, and his sweat, he rested a living for all 10 of us. I remember his thick, calloused hands. I remember him leaning against the drive pole of the barge, pushing his produce to market through the canal. I marvel still that he produced such a cornucopia of food without a single liter of gasoline. The only petroleum product we used in those times was the kerosene for my mother's lamp stove, a two wick and a four wick. That was her stove and that's what she cooked all our family food on for 20 years. My father also grew melons and cucumbers. A number of Bible translators say a melon patch, a number of others, including Moffat, the Daily Bible, Bible series, the Revised Standard Version, the Archaeological Study Bible, and even the Dutch Nieuwe Vertaling have all suggested that Jeremiah 10 verse 5 would be most accurately translated as a scarecrow in a cucumber field, even as we heard it this morning. Melons were cultivated in ancient Egypt in the days of the pharaohs. Cucumbers were grown in India 3,000 years ago. And at the time of Jeremiah, most or both would have been cultivated in the Middle East. When Holland was occupied by the Nazis, all first-class garden produce went direct from the market to Germany. Only second-class produce, unfit for them, remained for the Dutch to eat. Even though their nation had bountiful harvests, many Dutch could and did starve because most of the produce went to Germany. My father was not really a member of the resistance or the underground, but he never produced first-class produce during the whole of the war. The best endive was crowned with decay. Crates of finest fruit had mold at their apex. Even the boxes of whitest cauliflower had misshapen, discolored heads on top of them. Everything was conscientiously sold as second class, except for the cucumbers. People have known for hundreds of years that the food value of cucumbers is minimal. So my father had no compunction about sending first-class cucumbers to the Nazis. Let them eat empty luxury while nutritious food stayed at home. Putting a scarecrow in the grapes or among the cherry trees made sense to my father, but not this text at first glance. It would have baffled him. Birds were not attracted to our cucumbers. They valued them no more than my father did. The birds were never attracted to the melons either unless they were so overripe as to be spoiled. Insects attacked those crops but scarecrows, while of marginal benefit to frightened birds, are entirely useless at frightening away insects. Of how much value, then, is a scarecrow in a melon patch or a patch of cucumbers? None whatsoever. In fact, they would be worse than useless since birds eat insects. And that's precisely the point. Idol gods may have been interesting artifacts, but they were utterly useless otherwise. Jeremiah details how these idols are made from the cutting down of a tree to the shaping and carving of the wood, plating or gilding it with silver and gold, fastening it to the base with nails so that it will not totter or fall. Records from ancient Babylon show their idols on parade through the city, borne aloft on poles, nailed down to them so as not to fall. They are draped with royal robes of blue and purple, 
but there is no breath in any of them. The idols are all frauds, utterly useless. I would say that they are the creatures of their creators, but even that is not so because creatures have life, and life is conspicuously absent from them. Even as an artifact, a scarecrow in a melon patch accomplishes nothing. Those who have made it have made a fraud. Those who have placed it there have done so without knowledge because they too should know that it is useless. Jeremiah minces no words. He is not much of a temporizing comparative anthropologist here. He cuts to the quick of his message without any equivocation. Everything the idols are not is what the Lord is. He is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King. He controls the weather and the earthquakes. Nations cannot endure God's wrath. All of this is in fulsome Hebrew poetry. Then it breaks off suddenly into a verse of prose written in Aramaic. Tell them this, that is, tell the nations or the other people, these gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Then he goes right back to Hebrew poetry. Why does he break into Aramaic prose? Aramaic at that time was the language of trade, even as basic English is now, and as Latin was for centuries, and Greek before that, and Hausa was in Nigeria when I worked there. In the Middle East at that time, it was Aramaic. The hard, thin Jeremiah had a simple and uncompromising message for the Gentiles in the Middle East, spoken in their own language so they would hear it. Their gods were powerless and about to perish. He who is the portion of Jacob is not like these, he reiterates in poetry. He is the maker of all things, including Israel. He is their creator. He has not been created by them. And that is why he repudiates images, because they obscure the fundamental reality that God created all things and cannot be represented by mere human artifact, no matter how brilliant that artifact may be. Years before Jeremiah existed, the Ten Commandments had been written as we read them this morning. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. Uncompromisingly, the Lord had said, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Jesus Christ intrudes himself into that same sort of dynamic at Caesarea Philippi. He withdrew from Galilee northward, some 30 kilometers to Caesarea Philippi. There were very few Jews there. In fact, its original name was Panias reflecting the worship of the Greek nature god, Pan, half god, ha half man, and half goat, and the originator, so to speak, of the Pan pipes, or Pan flute. He was also the originator of unreasoning terror in flocks of sheep, hence our word panic and pandemonium. Right by Caesarea Philippi is a great hill and at the bottom of that hill is a deep cavern with a huge pool of still water, which is the origin of the Jordan River. That cave, which still exists, was said to be the birthplace of Pan. When Philip the Tetrarch ruled this area, he changed the name of Panias 
to Caesarea in honor of Caesar and to distinguish it from all the other Caesars, he also named it Philippi after himself. Since then, since the Caesar and the Philip was gone, it has gone back to being Bonias, which is clearly connected to Panias. 160 years ago, William Thompson published an exhaustive survey of the Holy Land, the land and the book. He had surveyed the area intensively in the 30 years that he had lived there. He enumerates the remains of no less than 14 ancient Syrian Baal temples in the area of Caesarea Philippi, each 16 to 50 meters long and half again as wide. At one he found a face over a meter long incised into marble. At another there was a temple platform 270 meters of stone by 170 meters made from blocks as much as four and a half meters thick and 19 meters long, all so perfectly shaped that not a knife blade could fit between them. The shadows of the god at, of the gods at Caesarea Philippi was long and deep. The place was steeped in paganism. Caesarea Philippi, 2,000 years ago, was the center of the Greek worship of Pan, and it also became a center of Roman emperor worship. There was a huge white marble temple to the godhead of Caesar Augustus. It had been built by Herod the Great, and his son Philip extended it. Even from a distance, that white marble monument glistened with the glory of Rome at the apogee of Caesar worship. Into the capital of what was essentially a foreign country, into the middle of all those powerful and ancient manifestations of so many other gods, came a homeless carpenter from Galilee with two simple questions. Who do people say I am? And who do you say I am? The answer to the first question is almost as revealing as the answer to the second. Some say John the Baptist, the disciples responded. No less a man than Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great in Mark 16, said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. Others said that, Jeremiah, that Jesus was Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah had a curious place in the expectations of Israel. Not only do we have the book of Jeremiah that we read from this morning, but he also figures significantly in the Apocrypha, those curious books between the Old and the New Testament that are part of the Catholic Bible and part of the historical traditions of Judaism, but considered too fanciful and so not accepted as part of the inspired Bible, even at earliest times. 2 Maccabees 2, 1 to 12, records the apocryphal, apocryphal tradition that Jeremiah hid the ark and the altar of incense in a cave on Mount Nebo, and that they will be revealed again when the Lord gathers his people together and shows them mercy. It does not say the coming of the Messiah, but that's how it was read within Hebrew culture. In 2 Esdras, another apocryphal book, the promise of God is for thy help, I will send my servants Isaiah and Jeremiah. 2 Maccabees 15 also records in detail a vision that Judas Maccabee had of Jeremiah presenting him with a golden sword to strike down his enemies before the most important battle that he ever fought against the Greeks. When Nicanor, the Greek general, and his host of elephants and 35,000 men were slain by the Maccabees. That's not to say that any of these apocryphal visions happened, but it affirms that for those who were steeped in those traditions, to say that Christ was Jeremiah was to pay him an extraordinary compliment as a harbinger of change, 
possibly even a forerunner of the Messiah. When others said that he was Elijah, they were saying he was as great as the greatest of the prophets, and they were also saying that he was unequivocally a forerunner of the Messiah. Malachi 4, verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. To this very day, when Passover is celebrated in any Jewish home, anywhere in the world, there is always a chair and a place at the table left vacant for Elijah in the expectation that when Elijah comes, the Messiah will not be far away. Who do people say the Son of Man is? All three of those identities, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, and Elijah, preface the Messiah. The buzz of the people clearly was of a messianic time. The Son of Man looks to the Messiah in the mind of the people. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter responded, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded, Blessed are you, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. That's true. To, re to leap from thinking of the forerunner to the actual Son of God that was such a paradigm shift that Peter would not have made such a leap all by himself. Jesus goes on to speak of Peter as the rock on which he will build his church and on giving him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's a whole sermon in itself. Theologians have teased the meanings of those sentences out into huge volumes. The sentences I want to be absolutely clear about today are not about theological obscurities, however, but simply who do people say the Son of Man is and who do you say that I am? He is Christ, the Son of the living God. The church has struggled with the answers to those two questions since the resurrection. So has every believer. Who, the world says, is vital. But the world sees him mostly in the presence of his followers, namely the church. In the final analysis, each and every one of you, who do you say that he is? Our personal answer to that question is the hinge of our personal faith, the engine of our being, and the means to converting the world. Our church's answer to that question is ultimately its only reason for being. Our church buildings will not be translated into heaven, but we will be if we recognize Christ as our personal Savior and Lord. The world may credit him for having been a very great prophet or teacher, but that is not enough to save us. The Bible is absolutely unequivocal. He is the son of the living God, yet flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, son of man, son of God. The balance is right there in that earth-shattering identity. We humans have constantly tried to shift that identity as we grapple with its awesome equipoise. The Gnostics emphasize the distance of Christ from ultimate divinity. The best of men, perhaps, but much less than God. St. Paul and the Bible repeatedly affirm the opposite. The Arians said Jesus was another created being, but less than God. The Nicene Council absolutely opposed them in 325 A.D., and that is why the Nicene Creed spells out Christ's divinitively, divinity so repetitively. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence of the Father. How many times can you say the same thing? That's the reason why it was said that way. That equipoise was lost again 35 years later, in the councils of Seleucian and Cerimian, 
as the teeter-totter shifted yet again to the humanity of Christ. The Athanasian Creed writes that balance once more. Then the Nestorians came along with a new twist on the old perspective, separating the divine nature of Christ from his human nature, making them two separate beings in one body rather than one integrated whole. In various ways, virtually every heresy the church has struggled with in the past 2,000 years has foundered on this very text. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a reef you can sail past if you accept it, or you can wreck on it if you do not. The gift of faith makes the difference. From the Cathars and the Bogomils to the Unitarians and the Jehovah Witnesses, from Thomas Jefferson to the Passover plot, and even to the Da Vinci Code, enormous numbers of well-meaning people have been unable to accept that a divinity so majestic and so sovereign would ever become one of us for no other reason than to die on our behalf. The message of the Bible is fundamentally just that, the message of God's awesome majesty and the message of his awesome grace. We can accept that message and find safe harbor behind it, or we will be smashed to ruin upon it. Sometimes we are like an addict who has to lose everything before recognizing his own helplessness in the face of his addiction. Sometimes he never does. If Jesus is not the Christ, he is even worse than a scarecrow in a melon patch because it, at least, is mute. He is not. His message reverberates in the scripture. It reverberates in those who know him. It reverberates in the still, small voice in our lives. If he is the Christ, then he demands nothing less than our all communicating that reality to the lost one at a time, redeeming creation in his name, committing ourselves to truth, justice, faithful stewardship. Half measures are not good enough for followers of Christ. After all, redeeming us was not a half measure for him. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Lord God, we come to you this morning to thank you yet again, to thank you for your marvelous words, to thank you for the treasure that it presents us, to thank you for the even more bountiful treasure that you have presented us with in the death of your son, the resurrection of your son, and the salvation of our souls as we celebrate them through your word and through all the songs that we praise you with. Amen.
I'll be leading you in the congregational prayer this morning. Um, just a couple things I wanted to bring to your attention is uh, Jesse and Stephanie Barda had a little baby girl, Sophia Tina, this Wednesday. So we'll pray for them and uh, grateful that everything worked out well. Um, also, in just driving around the countryside, I just wanted to draw your attention to how fortunate we are here in, here in county. Some of the crops south of here look really, really bad. And there's guys that have only had a half inch of rain since planting. Other areas never even got a crop in. And so there's lots of mental stress uh, in that area as well. Let's come to God in prayer. Merciful Lord, we come humbly before you to lay our thanksgiving and our needs at your throne. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to talk to you as a father. But also thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that drives us to reach out to you. Lord, uh, thank you for Dr. Van Dorf as he leaded us in worship this morning, and we pray for your blessing on the work that uh, he continues to do in Wyerton. Bless his family as well. And Lord God, we pray that uh, we recognize what idols we have around us as well. Dear God, we pray for uh, Aaron Korbermacher as he leads us in worship this evening too, and give him all that he needs. Lord, we thank you that we can come here freely to worship you. Uh, we don't have to be concerned about armies or hiding. And Lord, we are so blessed here in Canada. Lord, we also uh, think of those that uh, can't be here and think of Femi Van Amersport, who's uh, homebound. And Lord, there's probably other people too. And Lord, we pray for you to be with them. We pray for your spirit to guide them to still love and honor you. Lord, we thank you for the technology that we can live stream these services. And Lord, we know that the internet has wonderful good things, but it also has many bad things. And so, Lord, we pray for discernment. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us through that as well. Lord, we uh, ask, too, that you would guide us and encourage us through your Spirit to talk to those and to be example to those that don't want to worship you that have in the past. We think of other family members. We think of other worshipers. And, Lord, we pray that you would open their hearts and their minds to want to serve you, to worship you, to be in community with other believers. Lord God, we thank you for the birthdays that are celebrated, going to be celebrated this week for Chloe and John, Bryce and Peter, David and Cheryl. Lord God, we thank you for the many years and we pray for many more for them. We pray for Naomi and for Gavin as they prepare for their wedding for the next uh, couple of weeks from now. Lord, we pray that uh, keep them chilled and relaxed through this preparation period. Lord God, I want to thank you for the baby girl that you gave to Jesse and Stephanie, and Lord, we thank you that that all went well. Lord, we pray for your blessing on that child. We pray for wisdom for them as parents as they raise her, and that she too would want to honor and serve you. Lord, we pray for the Selkie family that's all the way in the Philippines as they've lost of Dwayne. And Lord, we thank you for the work that he was so committed to there. And Lord, we pray that the work he did there has, has uh, been able to be fruitful and that there's many believers there that can carry on his work. Lord, we pray for that family as they're miles away from their families here. And Lord, we pray for strength for them. Dear God, there's ailments and health issues in this church too with our community here. And Lord, whether it's physically or whether it's mentally, and Lord, we pray that you would be with, with those. Pray for healing and we pray for uh, stability. Dear God, we think of some families that uh, have struggles and whether it's family strife, Lord God, we ask that you would open their hearts and their minds for forgiveness, for acceptance, for reconciliation. And Lord, this is definitely not what you had in plan for the family. Dear God, we want to pray for Sarah Steele as she's heading to Guatemala this week. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with her and the work that she does there. Lord, we pray for safety and we pray for safety traveling there, but also safety as she's there. And we do bless her work and also the work for the organization she's with, Hope for Home Missions in, in uh, Guatemala, an orphanage there with, for children with special needs. And Lord, we thank you for her to your opportunity and for her desire to serve you there. Lord, we think of so many other volunteer programs that all focus in Central America and Mission to Haiti, Farmer to Farmer, World Renew, and the program that Sarah's on. And Lord, we see so much need there and so many corrupt governments and so much broken relationships between government and people 
And Lord, all these broken relationships have to do with a broken relationship with you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open their hearts and their minds. Dear God, we want to thank you for Pastor Gary and the work he does here continuously. And Lord, we pray for your, a good vacation time and a rest time. And uh, Lord, there's so many others that are heading to holidays. And Lord, we pray for safety for them as well. Dear God, we've had some timely rains in this area. And it's not the case everywhere. So Lord, there's um, certainly some mental concerns for those that are looking at their vacant fields that are sitting empty. And Lord, we uh, have so much prosperity here. And help us to use that to further your kingdom work. Help us to uh, share our prosperity to give you and to others to flourish your message of salvation and grace to everybody else. Thank you, Lord, for the support of the anticipated church edition. Use this also, Lord, to further your kingdom and your promises, Lord, for your people here. It's just so obvious when it's just a few years ago we were concerned for no young families really sticking around, and now we have so many again. And thank you, Lord, for their commitment to the Blythe Church and for further your kingdom work. To God, as we move into uh, September season two, there's many programs that are getting started and many organizers getting focused. And Lord, we pray for you to be with those two. And we thank you, Lord, for their desire to teach your children about your majesty and your prayer promises. Lord God, we also help us to represent you well in our daily lives, whether we're at work or at home or doing business or even fooling around and playing on vacations. May everything we say and do represent you. And forgive us, Lord, when we stumble. To God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just going to butt in for a few minutes. Um, Although I'm not, no longer a deacon, my final job was to arrange the um, annual bus trip. So I've done that once, once again, and it's um, a month from today. We are going to go to the uh, Butterfly Conservatory in Cambridge and also going to the African Lion Safari. There is no age restriction for this, so uh, young, old, anybody can come. So seats are starting to fill up, so I'd... Uh, Come see me, and I'll get you on the bus, and it should be a lot of fun. So um, we can celebrate the 50th anniversary of African Lion Safari, so let's, uh, let's go wild. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this morning, there will be two offerings. Uh, the first one is for the church. And the second is for Shalem. So that is for Shalem Mental Health Network. Uh, for all people and communities are able to access meaningful, relevant, and effective support for their mental health and well-being, regardless of financial circumstances. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, in this moment, here and now, we give you thanks for all of, your, all of our many blessings. Even in our most dire time of need, you are there, our biggest blessing of all. In thanks and in gratitude, we give up our offerings of music, time, and money. Please accept our offerings to the church and to the Shalem Mental Health Network. Bless the work that goes on within the organization as well. In your name, amen. <laughs>
receive now the benediction of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.